Hello, Super Solars. So glad to have you joining us this fabulous Sunday, wherever you are. We've got a powerful show once again with Gary Zukov. Gary Zukov has been one of the preeminent spiritual teachers in my life. When I read Seed of the Soul back in 1989, my life just completely shifted. I got it. And today, we're going to be helping you do the same. Delving into what Gary says is at the root of all of our problems, every single one of them. And the answer might surprise you. Mm, very simple. Gary says, as do many spiritual teachers and leaders throughout the world, number one problem in the world is fear. So today we're going to learn that fear comes in all sorts of disguises. I remember on the Oprah show, I used to ask people, what are you afraid of? And particularly men would always say, I ain't afraid of nothing. I ain't scared of nothing. I ain't scared of nobody. Well, most people do have some fears. I do still. It might look like anger. It might look like rage or depression, or it might look like jealousy or hostility. Beneath all of these emotions is the same thing, fear blocking us from reaching our fullest potential. Fear is what's blocking you from experiencing real joy, no matter what is going on. At the, if you go down beneath the layers, look at the layers, look at the layers, you will always find that it's fear. It's what's blocking you from your soul. This is really powerful stuff, and I must say, when you get it, whoo, everything changes. So define fear in, in terms of what people know it to be. Well, there's two kinds of fear, Oprah. The first is fear when you are physically threatened, when yeah. there's a snarling animal in front of you or you see that you're on a ledge and the cliff is crumbling. And that is the kind of fear that helps keep you safe. Mm -hmm. That fear disappears as soon as the danger disappears. That's not the kind of fear I'm talking about. I'm talking about a fear that is chronic and acute. That means it's long lasting and it recurs with painful intensity again and again and again. Fear is what keeps you from living your fullest potential. Fear is what distracts you. Fear is what makes you feel separate from other people and this world. Fear is what clouds your perception so you're not seeing what is happening clearly. Fear is what um, impedes your judgment so you're not thinking clearly and cannot behave or speak appropriately. Fear is what keeps you from being in touch with your intuition. So fear is the opposite of love. Fear is the opposite of love. And anything that isn't love is fear? Correct. Correct. So fear is your anger, forms of fear. Let's talk about forms of fear. Anybody who is an angry person is also a fearful person. That's right. It's important to understand the scope of what we're talking about. This right. is a fundamental show. Yeah, it's fundamental. That's what I was saying to the producer, Jill. This is fundamental. That's right. Yeah. Because the Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because this, this is big. I mean, this is like a major spiritual principle here. The first step is to begin to recognize fear. To and be once, aware of what it is, yeah. Exactly. And once you do, you will see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Here are some of the different forms of fear. Anger is a form of fear. Jealousy. Anxiety. Anxiety. Depression. Vengefulness, if you seek revenge. A sense of being righteous. Any impulse in you to judge other people or to be critical. Is fear. Is fear, is a form of fear. And hatred. Hatred is a form of fear, including self-hatred. Mm -hmm. Big Any bigotry or prejudice. Absolutely. Any bigotry or prejudice. Anything in you that says you are better than someone else or worse than someone else. Is fear. Is fear. In Macho behavior. Macho behavior. I know that one very well. That is all fear-based. Mm -hmm. Violence. Every form of violence, physical violence, emotional violence, psychological violence, that is all, those are all forms of fear. Are you beginning to see the scope of what we are discussing And now? even impatience, you say, is fear? Impatience is a form of fear. Impatience is a fear that you will not get what you feel is important to you because someone else is asking for what is important to that person. Okay, so how do you explain to people how all of these forms of fear are really fear? They are, there are many other forms of fear. And fear is the basic element in the human experience. This is how fundamental fear is. In other words, to say that the human species is insecure is stating the obvious. The question is, how shall we deal with this insecurity? Correct. 
shall you reach outward to try to change the world by judging another person, by trying to build a bigger business, by finding the right husband and a three children family mm -hmm. that you create, by having just the rightly uh, braided dreadlocks, mm -hmm. by uh, having a larger portfolio, by having a different car, by living in a different neighborhood, on and on the list goes. This is reaching outward to make you feel better when your fear is expressing yourself. Whenever you see an angry person, you are looking at a frightened person. Whenever you are seeing a person who is doing harm to someone else, physical or emotional harm or psychological harm, that person is in intense pain. The one who is doing the harm is hurting very much. That person is frightened. Can you see how many frightened people there are in the world? Mm -hmm. So the people who think you can just forget about it, you cannot. Forget about, deny your pain, you cannot. No, your pain will not deny or forget about you. The next time you feel jealous, you will feel the same pain. The next time you feel frightened about paying the rent, you will feel the same pain. The next time you look at yourself and you say, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, my hair is too gray, my hair is too black, Whatever it is, you will feel the same pain. The universe will not allow you to forget what it is that you need to heal. I get this. This is what I do now, since because I read your book 10 years ago. Uh, so I've been thinking about this for a long time. So when w one of these emotions com comes up for me, I ask the question, what is it I am afraid of? Yes. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Yeah. That I is an excellent so. question. <laughs> Back in a minute. This idea is so simple. It's easy to forget how powerful it is. If you want the world to be more loving and compassionate, you have to become more loving and compassionate. Gandhi said it best, be the change you want to see. Well, that becomes rhetoric in the world unless you're willing to apply that. You know, on Twitter the other day, somebody said, well, hey, Oprah, how do you know that good things wouldn't happen to people even if they didn't make the shift? Good things happen because you make the shift, because the energy that you're putting out into the world is always the energy that's coming back to you. That's third law of motion in physics. What you put out is coming back, equal and opposite reaction. Now meet Carrie. She says that she is paralyzed by a fear of being alone. And she admits that she tries to buy people so that they won't leave her. Uh, that's a big realization. So take a look at how fear is causing pain in Carrie's life. I have a great job. At this point in my life, I'm a lot further than people my age. But deep down inside, a lot of times, there's, there's a deep-seated fear that I have of being abandoned, being alone. I feel a lot of it roots back to my dad when I was younger abandoning me. And my dad was very ill mentally. He had a lot, a lot of problems. My father committing suicide was the ultimate way to leave. Because there's nothing I can do to fix that. The fear of being alone feels horrible. There are so many things I've done out of fear. I buy things for men in my relationships to keep them around. I've bought a car for someone. I have bought everything from food to clothes, whatever the person needs so that, that I feel like they need me. I have literally begged somebody to stay with me. I will hear myself inside feeling like I need to let that person go. And out of my mouth will be coming, please don't leave me. I'm nothing without you. When I look back at that, I just feel sad that I feel like I have to do that. That I feel like I'm not worth more than that. I finally do understand that I have this fear and I just don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to change it. and I don't know what to, where to turn. What do you want to say, Gary? Thank you, Carrie. That took courage and a lot of clarity. And that's how you challenge fear. First, you have to see it. Otherwise, you squander your time blaming the person you're with. He's ingrateful. He doesn't appreciate me. 
He doesn't see my beauty. On and on. But it's looking inside yourself to begin to see what your inner dynamics are. And when you look inside yourself and say, there's an, a bottomless pit in me that needs to be filled, then you are doing significant inner work. Then you are looking at what needs to be done. You are seeing what it is that needs to be healed in you and the depth and power of it, mm. the complexity of it. It's and hard. This, it's hard. It's hard, but didn't you say to the producers that hearing Gary on past shows saying how angry he used to be? Oh, yeah. It, which I is hard have. to believe looking at his little smile and face now. I, I know, and it gave me <laughs> how hope. How angry he used to be. It gave me hope because I get rage. I mean, rage. Screaming. Rage. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's all learned. I don't think it's learned. I think it's somewhere deep down in me. And I have to fix that. Mm -hmm. Why do you I was... feel so unlovable that you think you have to buy things and pay people <laughs> to stay with you in order to earn their love? <clears throat> because I'm a real giving person by nature. When people ask me to do something, I have no problem in helping them. Like at work, if somebody asks me a question, someone new, uh, no problem in helping them. But, but you I... know the difference between being really giving yeah. and... Yeah, yeah, or giving to... to, to get back mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. instead of just thank you, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of times thank you's enough, but when it comes to personal relationships, I always feel like you said, why are you so ungrateful? Look at everything I do for you. How could you do that? How can you leave me? Then I'll say, get out. And then they'll go and I'll say, please don't go. Please stay, because I need you. What you're doing is beautiful, Carrie, because you are beginning to dissect your own personality. You are beginning to see what it is in you that requires healing. And this is the first step. And I salute you in doing that. When you look at your fear, and in this case, your particular form of fear has a feeling for you mm. inside. When that horrible, painful feeling comes back, that is what you can challenge. That is what you can say to yourself, this is what I don't want in my life anymore. And you don't have to, at that point, put a label on it. You don't have to say, I'm unworthy or I am not beautiful because you'll recognize the way your body and your mind respond when this energy is a part of you. Now, this is fundamental to spiritual growth because this is a part of yourself that you need to heal in order to move into your fullest potential. Mm -hmm. Because you can't give all of your gifts when you're trying, when you have second agendas in your giving. Right. Mm -hmm. And when my father committing suicide, I, uh, it opened my eyes. I just wanted to clean house. I wanted to start cleaning my house instead of fixing somebody else's house all the time. That's right. And as you clean your house, you'll be able to see with more and more clarity and compassion your father's struggles, that they are his struggles, and that they interlock with your struggles. That's why you are his daughter. And you will honor his path and gain power and clarity from looking at the painfully difficult relationship that you have. That relationship has a purpose, and that purpose is to give you the strength that is required in your life to begin to give the gifts that your soul wants to give. Right. This is from page 120 of Seat of the Soul, okay? I love this one. The human emotional spectrum can be broken down into two basic elements, he says, love and fear, anger, resentment, Vengeance are all expressions of fear, as are guilt, regret, embarrassment, shame, sorrow. These are lower frequency currents of energy. Now remember, we're just energy fields. We're putting out energy all the time. And the lower frequency are those things that are derived from fear. They produce feelings of you feeling depleted, sad, depressed, weak, unable to cope, exhausted. The highest frequency current, the highest energy current, is love. That's why when you're in love, when you're loving, when you're surrounded by people that love you, you feel buoyant and you feel radiant and there's a lightness about you and happiness and joy about you and kindness and grace. That's because 
all of those equal love. This is the key. This is the mighty, mighty, mighty big one that changed the way I operated forever since 1989 when I first read this book. When I got this, my life, everything shifted. Your intentions create the reality that you experience. Sit with that for a moment. Your intentions create the reality that you experience. And your intentions are at one with cause and effect, with your actions and what happens as a result of your actions. So therefore, be mindful always of what you really intend, because that is what is coming back to you. Gary Zukov says, with every decision we make, we choose to act out of fear or love. And when you choose fear, you choose to experience pain. This is Liz. She was an ambitious newspaper reporter, hungry to uh, write front page stories, but her drive to always be the best ended up giving her panic attacks. She recently discovered at the core of her anxiety was fear. Take a look. I've always lived with fear. I didn't realize it at the time. It seemed like I was always afraid of actually just not being good enough. I felt like I always had to earn everybody else's approval. I was always looking outside myself to be validated. Even when I got my undergraduate degree, I said, see, I must be okay. I've done this, working at the newspaper as a reporter. It was an ego boost. I really only wanted to work on the big stories. It made me feel like I was important. When I used to say something negative, it was usually in an effort to make myself feel better, which came from a fear of not being good enough. Eventually, the fear became overwhelming, and I started having panic attacks. I would just not be able to catch my breath. I felt dizzy, start hyperventilating. I was in the emergency room a couple of times thinking that, you know, this has to be, there has to be something wrong with me here. And they kept telling me no. I felt completely burnt out and, and just afraid. What I learned from Seed of the Soul was what authentic power actually is, that it has to be something that can't be taken from you. And I realized that there was only two things that could not be taken from me, and that was God's love for me and my love for other people. What I started to do after I had this revelation was I began to center myself in love. Now, I ask myself the question of where my motivation is coming from. Am I coming out of love? Am I coming from fear? I keep working towards recentering myself and coming from a place of love. And as I continue to do that, it gets easier and easier. That's pretty big. Yeah. That's really big. Yeah. So how did you make that shift? That sounds really, you know, beautiful to say, I now am centered in love, but what does that mm -hmm. really mean? Well, it's, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. It's not something that's been easy. Um, it's something that, when I find myself feeling afraid, and especially anxiety's been a big thing for me, when I find myself feeling anxious, I have to stop and say, okay, what's really going on here? Oh, good. And it always comes back to I'm afraid of something. And I just have to keep reminding myself that really my only power comes from love. And I have to keep coming from love. Mm -hmm. I got a good one for you. Um, I, I, you know, I'm always dealing with the weight issues. And, you know, we did the show about addiction and so forth. So I'm always examining what does this really mean and when I'm eating and am I eating just because I'm hungry and all that. And in the process of doing that, I recalled a memory where my father had said to me when I was a young teenage girl and I was first talking about going on a diet. And he said to me, no need for you to go on a diet because you come from a family of big women. All your people are big. He says, your mama's big, your grandmama was big, all your aunts are big, you're big people, so you're going to be big. So I've watched, you know, my family, my family of big women thinking, my belief is that no matter what I do, I'm going to be one of those big women. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. And I cannot say for you what your unconscious uh, parts are telling you. It may be there's an unconscious part that's saying, I'm not going to be beautiful until I get thin. Doesn't matter how many big women mm -hmm. were in my family. And what I am suggesting is that when you really look at your fears and you heal them, 
you can look at yourself and you will be beautiful no matter how you Correct. are. Correct. It doesn't matter if you are obese. It doesn't matter if you weigh 300 pounds. You will look at yourself and say... It comes from a family of big women. <laughs> you will yes. look at yourself and say, I am beautiful. Then, if you want to change the shape of your body, it will not be a fear-driven impulse, a fear that you will not be accepted if you don't, a fear that you will not be lovable if you don't. It will come from other places. You Ooh, may say... That made her scratch her head right there. She just went, whew. Oh, my goodness. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's like, oh, my God, it's like so... It's pure accepting yourself and, and loving every part of yourself. And that, when I listen to it, I think, oh, my God, what a journey to achieve that. That's a lot. <laughs> That's the journey we're on. Right, exactly. That's so I'm like, the Whoa. Earth School. That's authentic power. Yeah. There's no fear involved. When you see how beautiful you are, you will see it everywhere. You will see it in other people. One of the things that I just love so much about Gary Zukav and his teachings from Seed of the Soul is his willingness to also be vulnerable, to share his personal stories, to help us all grow. And in this next clip, Gary opens up about some of his own fears. Watch Gary walk his talk. Don't you think that for people to start to begin to unravel this, when you feel depressed, yeah. angry, frustrated, anxiety, and all those other things we list, that the first question should be, what is it I'm really afraid of? That is a question that leads you to what is really going on here so that you're not reacting to the surface of things. That's an excellent question. What am I really afraid of? I wish I had known that question when I was in my 20s and 30s and 40s. <laughs> <laughs> what am I afraid of? Then if you can identify that fear, pull that up. I call it, you know, pulling that up and call that out. You can then challenge that instead of the thing that you're reacting to. Exactly. I told Linda about, it was quite a while ago, about a year ago, I'm drawn to this woman, mm -hmm. a woman who is in, I don't even remember the circumstances now. I think she was in one of our events. And I share with my spiritual partner these things that at first I was very ashamed of. I share them because they are parts of my life, if I'm ashamed of them, that I want to heal. And I am intent on healing in this lifetime. So I told Linda, I'm drawn to our colleague, this woman. And the first thing Linda, after our being together for six or seven years, said was, what are you frightened of? What are you so frightened of? And as I went on that exploration, I realized it was what was happening in my life. And what was happening in my life was the Oprah Winfrey show. And Oprah Winfrey. Get out. <laughs> and, really? And 13 to 20, 13 million to 20 million people a show watching. And what I was so terrified of was, what if I can't walk my talk? What if I can't meet my own expectations? Where would I go? Everyone recognizes me now. It seems like everyone watches this show. <laughs> I can't hide anywhere. Mm. And I was so terrified. And, and that allowed me to challenge that directly. Not that I was attracted to one of my colleagues. And as I looked at that issue, and I realized this is my new life. This is what I'm doing, and I choose to do it. And there's no place to hide, but where could I ever go to hide from myself? Correct. Then, and I, as I began to work in this way, this attraction to our colleague evaporated, and she became the same beautiful colleague that she's been for years, that I love so much. And that desire to use another person disappeared like dew in the sun, in mm -hmm. the morning sun. It could not have So you would be seeking solace in that other person to, what, appease your fear of what being on this show would do? Because you all don't know, I mean, those of you who don't watch regularly probably don't know this, that when I, I read Seed of the Soul back in 1989 and first called Gary, he didn't know my name. I had to spell it. And um, <laughs> so I could tell he was not ready for prime time or uh, <laughs> daytime, no time. What is that name again? Uh, so 10 years later, I call, you know, called him back and you know, tried to talk to him about coming on the show. And the first show, and really, I think for the most part, certainly national television he's ever done was his show, and just got a TV this year. 
you just got a television. Because I said, get it. You know, the first few shows Gary was on, he'd say, well, Oprah, some friends are taping it, and we're going to go down the mountain to their home, and, and we're going to, I was going, get yourself a TV, would you? You know, they come in big screens now. But so I can imagine for you that would be terrifying to come on the show, right? Yeah. It, it was not just television, Oprah. It was realizing that I cannot become anonymous anymore. Mm -hmm. I cannot hide. If I'm having a if I'm having a difficult day, if I'm impatient, people see me in the airport. And they say, Aren't you Mr. Love? <laughs> Mr. Love feeling, complaining about a ticket? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, what I have found is that this is an enormous aid to me because I don't want to be impatient. I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to be critical, even when I'm by myself at home. It's not something that I want in my energy anymore. I don't want to die being critical, even if I'm alone. Mm -hmm. I want to be whole and inwardly secure. I want to live a life of authentic power. I do not want to live a life that is controlled by fears, including those that I'm not aware of. And that's why we're doing this show. And once I began to see that and to say yes to my life, then my attraction to a woman disappeared. By going for the root of it, I was able to find the root and pull the root. I wasn't worried about Am I attracted to her because she's younger? Am I attracted to her because she's older? Am I attracted to her because she's rich, smart, wealthy, poor? None of that was relevant. What was relevant was, as we've discussed on shows before on sexual addiction, I was feeling powerless. That's another, exper that's another word for frightened. Powerlessness. Powerless. And you lose power when you are afraid. You do. The painful experience of fear is losing is releasing your energy in fear and doubt. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it can only bring fear and doubt back to you. And as you begin to grow in power, authentic power in your life, you learn how to release your energy only in love and trust. And that brings back to you love and trust. And the experience of your life changes dramatically. Now let's talk about another one of my favorite topics on the spiritual path to being the best you can be. It's surrendering. It's knowing when to surrender. Gary says surrendering is a way to move back into the flow of your life because there is a flow, you know. You're either in flow or out of flow. And the whole goal is to be in flow. When you feel frustrated and angry because you can't steer your life in the direction you want, you have to get back in flow, and you do that by letting go. I so know this is true. Gary says that when you refuse to accept what's happening in your life, you're really robbing yourself of peace and happiness. Surrendering is the key to moving on and creating a better life. And remember, surrender doesn't mean giving up. So many people mean, okay, it means I'm gonna give up. No, it means after you've done everything that you can, you surrender it to the power that is greater than yourself and stop resisting what is. It's really difficult to get some people to understand that surrender doesn't mean giving up. No, it does not mean giving up. And in fact, surrender means accepting your life. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the goal of spiritual development. We're talking about the means of spiritual development. And we are talking about the fulfillment of a powerful human life on the earth. This starts and ends with accepting your life as it is. And that means without resisting it. Mm -hmm. Your life is valuable. Everything that you feel is valuable. valuable. It all has meaning. Correct. And as you resist your life, you resist the power of your life and you resist the value of your experiences. Right. Now let's meet Susan. She has been struggling to move on after her marriage to the man of her dreams ended eight years ago. And ever since, she's been haunted by feelings of betrayal and continues to refuse to trust anyone in her life. Maybe you'll see yourself. And Susan, take a look. When I was 24, I married the man of my dreams, my knight in shining armor. We get married and everything seems to be fine. 
and I just have this feeling that something wasn't right. About 10 years into the marriage, I discovered that we were very different people from each other, and he was living a separate life. One day in my own home, I found what he never wanted me to find. I found magazines and books that did not pertain to our lifestyle as a married couple, and it really, really frightened me. I felt very, very betrayed. My husband had very different sexual expectations than what we had in the marriage. He had some infidelities. My life changed dramatically. I didn't know who I was. I had lost my identity. And I was living with a stranger. and I didn't know what to do. I don't know why I was betrayed. I didn't deserve it. I know I'm supposed to let go. And it's, it's odd, I've let go of him, but I can't let go of what happened. Susan, when is the first time you suspected that something was wrong? The day before we were married. The day before you were married. Yeah. And how long and were you married? <clears throat> 22 years. 22 years. And then when was the next time that you had a strong feeling that something was wrong? About two years later. And between the first time and two years later, did you have other feelings that something might be wrong? Yes. Every once in a while, something would come up, and it just didn't make sense to me. And then, when was it that you found the closet in the, with the books in them? Uh, we'd been married about 15 years. And then how long after uh, did you get divorced? Um, eight years, seven years. We don't have much time together except on this show. So I want to go straight to the heart of the matter. Your intuitional system is excellent. It informed you the day before you were married that something was wrong. It continued to inform you until two years later you knew that something was wrong. And it continued to inform you until 10 or 12 years or 13 years later you found a closet full of books that confirmed how much something was wrong. And then after two years of being in shock, you continued to be in this marriage for a longer period of time. Not paying attention to what you were feeling was resisting your life. It was not accepting your life. And because you didn't accept your life, in that first moment, you created almost a quarter of a century of pain for yourself. There's a story that I love. It's about a man who's on a boat that begins to sink, a sailing boat. And was, as water comes over the deck, another sailing boat approaches. And the man says, go away. God will save me. But the boat continues to sink. And then he's standing on top of the cabin. And a fishing boat arrives. And the man says, go away. God will save me. And his boat continues to sink until nothing but the mast is, the top of the mast is above water. And he's clinging to it. And a Coast Guard cutter arrives, and the man says, go away, God will save me. And then the boat sinks, and he drowns. And when he awakens in heaven, he goes to God angrily and says, I put all of my faith in you, and you did nothing for me. You let me down. You betrayed me. And God says, I did not. I sent you a sailing boat a fishing boat, and a Coast Guard cutter. <laughs> the day before your marriage, you knew that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. That was a sailing boat. Two years later, you knew something was wrong even more strongly. That was the fishing boat. When you found the closet, that was the Coast Guard cutter. And then you sank. 
resisting what you knew and what you feel is not accepting your life. Your life had power in it, and your life does have power in it. You did not accept what your life gave you, but you can accept what your life gives you now. You may not understand all of it, but you can hold the thought that it is valuable, that it is meaningful, that it carries information, and that the universe is compassionate and wise. And that is why you are having the experiences that you are. Can you see? Yes, I can see it, and I, and I can hear you. It's very hard to realize it on the inside. It is very hard. The pain is real. The pain is real. So I have an exercise to suggest for you. And this is one that I also suggest for all of the people who were watching, because it can be used by many. Whenever you feel yourself saying, yes, but, in other words, I say to you, you have a life before you. You have potential. And it's up to you to step into that potential. And you say, yes, but he deceived me. And I say, you have joy and happiness waiting for you if you choose to create it. And you say, yes, but he knew he was lying to me. And I point out to you that this is a compassionate universe, and you say, yes, but. Every time you feel the impulse to say, yes, but, change that to, now, what? However, between the time that you say, yes, but, and catch yourself, and the time you say, now, what, do two things. Number one, stop. Stop what you are doing. And number two, feel, feel. And then say to yourself, now what? The pain is still there, but you are aware. And you are aware of the value of your life. And you say in that context, now what? Can you do that? I can do that. Will you do that? I will do that. I have to do that. <clears throat> you have to do that if you want the life that you feel is calling to you. And I do feel a life calling to me. I just can't get to it so far. You can get to it. Yes, but. Now what? Now what? <laughs> I would like to share with the audience that's watching us something that's important to me to say. We are speaking now about the most important thing that you will do in your life as you move toward your own fulfillment, and that is to accept your own life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, because your show is so powerful and the intention behind it is so good, people, I suspect, some anyway, will watch the show hoping that you or a guest will say something that will give them what you call a light bulb moment mm -hmm. that will change their lives so that they won't have to do it. It may be that in watching a show, an Oprah show, or in watching this one, you will receive or have a moment of illumination. It's aha. Aha. But aha means, have, aha, I now must do something. Aha. That is exactly right. Correct. If you have a moment of illumination, you will know it, because in that moment, you will see your experiences from a different perspective. Absolutely. And from that different perspective, you will see what you need to do to move forward into health and into your own fulfillment. Use what you see when the light goes on. Mm -hmm. No one else can do that for you. That is your job. Why not accept what your life is giving you now? If you see something that needs to be done or changed in your life, no matter how small, experiment with changing it. That is accepting your life. If you say to yourself, no, I can't possibly do that because it would, yes, but, then you are resisting your life. If you resist your life, you resist what you can learn from it. You resist what you can gain from it. Your life is powerful. Your life is worthy. You are worthy. You are valuable. Accept that. 
whew, that's a powerful experience for me. The Gary nugget I will keep near to my heart forever is that only by surrendering to what is. You have to surrender to what is first. Only then can you begin to change what is. If you won't accept what is, you can't change what is. You get that? That's a big one. See you next week on Super Soul Sunday.